All right, welcome everyone to the first session of the University of Minnesota Extension Pollinator Habitat webinar series. We are so glad to have all of you join us live, and I know many will be watching the recording hopefully later on tonight or Friday. Um, today is the first session of a three-part series, and today Julie Weisenhorn will be giving her presentation on creating a pollinator-friendly garden. These presentations will be recorded and I'll be emailing those recordings out on Friday, February 3rd, so this Friday. I will also include all of the resource links that will be shared during the presentations in that e email, as well as a very, very short evaluation to help us improve our work, so be sure to check your email after Friday. We are also in the process of planning several in-person summer workshops related to beekeeping and helping native pollinators, which we will talk more about on Thursday. So stay tuned uh, for Thursday's session. Now, before we get started, I'd like to go over how we can all interact with each other in a Zoom webinar format. Please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to ask questions. I will be asking the speakers questions from only that section. For any comments that you'd like to share with the group, please use the chat feature. If there is a question that someone else asked in the Q&A function that you are also interested in as well, uh, you can upvote that question to make sure I can ask those questions to Julie uh, before our time runs out. Uh, next slide, please, Julie. Thank you. I'd also like to introduce our fantastic team of extension educators that are making this webinar series possible today. Claire Lacan is an extension educator in Rice and Steele counties. Robin Trott is a local extension educator in Douglas County. Myself, my name is Tara Young, local extension educator in Hubbard County. Uh, Shane Bougea of Blue Earth and Lesueur counties. Troy Salzer, extension educator in St. Louis County. And we also have Sam Talbot joining us today from Dakota County as a local extension educator. Along with today's speaker, we have a great group of incredibly knowledgeable people. I can say that because I work with them regularly. <laughs> Claire and Shane have entomology backgrounds, so we like to call them our bug people. Um, and Robin and Troy are horticulture geniuses, as I like to say. So I am so proud to be able to brag about my colleagues and the work that we've done. Now, I am happy to introduce Julie Weisenhorn as today's speaker, who will be telling the story of pollinators from a landscape and plant selection standpoint and present some practical options to help make this world a better place for these valuable insects in our own gardens. Julie Weisenhorn holds communications and horticulture degrees from the University of Minnesota, where she taught landscape design and later served as an extension master gardener state director. Today, she provides statewide horticulture education to a variety of audiences on design, plant selection, and best management practices. She also serves on the Minnesota Nursery and Landscape Association Education Committee and chairs the Minnesota Department of Agriculture Noxious Weed Advisory Committee. Julie coordinates and fields listeners' questions on the WCCO Smart Gardens weekly radio show. In her own words, this is the best job I've ever had. Welcome, Julie, and take it away. Thank you, Tara and Shane and Claire and... Troy and Robin, geez, it's nice to see you all. Uh, it's been too long. Uh, I am happy to talk to everybody today about pollinator, uh, creating pollinator friendly landscapes. And I wanna start out by just giving us a moment to think about how curious we all are at young ages uh, about being outdoors. And we feel connected to nature. We feel this need to be in it and to care for it. And uh, that is called biophilia. This is the passionate love of life and all that is alive. That came from Eric Fromm, who's a psychoanalyst, and he wrote The Anatomy of Human Destructiveness in 1973. And biophilia is this innate, this emotional affiliation that we have with uh, live, other living organisms. And uh, here I am planting my Mardigan lily bulbs late one November. So I wanna talk about that. I wanted to just kind of preface with that because it's important that we think about what we can do as human beings to make landscapes better 
for important animals, for our plants, wildlife, and particularly today, we're going to talk about pollinators. So I was really curious about how people saw their landscapes in relation to pollinators. And so I started a survey uh, back in August of 2017 at the Minnesota State Fair. We had a group of master gardeners who helped us out uh, surveying people. And over time, that's this survey is still open. Over time, we have had almost all responses from our Minnesota counties. We've had 86 out of 87 counties respond. And we're up to, this number is actually a little bit low. We're almost up to 8,800 responses to this survey. So people who have stepped forward and taken this survey on their own. Here's a QR code if you're curious about taking it. There's also the website as well. 78% uh, completed the survey. You know, sometimes people start a survey and then they kind of give up or they get busy with something else. So we've had about 67, 6,800 people finish the survey. And respondents received a score that ranked them in one of three levels of pollinator gardeners, either a kind of a beginning or a intermediate or kind of a somewhat experienced and then a more advanced uh, pollinator gardener. And they submitted their emails so that they could get an email back with their score and then the responses and some resources that we had for them. So this was all self-selected. And it was kind of a way to raise people's awareness of how their landscapes measure up to when it comes to pollinators. So take that survey, it's uh, very short, just eight questions. And think about this, think about how we need to interact with landscapes. We want healthy pest-free plants. We want them to be attractive and enjoyable. We want seasonal bloom. I think since I've been uh, a, a gardener and I became a master gardener back in 1996, I think I have always heard people say, I want something that blooms like all season. I want flowers all season long in my garden. And we want year round interest. So even beyond that, even days like today, we wanna to look out in our gardens and see something of interest, whether it be twigs or stems or forms, whatever it might be. We want landscapes that are long lived and we want them to be functional for us. We have to accomplish certain things in our landscapes. Uh, we also want to be able to maintain them at some level that is applicable to our lifestyle. And then we want them to be affordable and increase our property values as well. And it's not so different for pollinators. They want nutritious plants. They want a lot of diversity, which we do too. They need habitat and nesting sites. They want also a constant bloom so that they have something to forage on and they want plants that are non-toxic. So these are, this are kind of like a really nice definition of what a pollinator friendly landscape would entail. So healthy landscapes in general have good overall performance. They have better functionality for many years. They reduce and eliminate and lower your maintenance. And I don't think anybody on this, uh, this presentation really wants to do a whole lot more work in their yards. Uh, we want it to be enjoyable and we want to spend those really nice days of the growing season with our family and friends and then enjoying our landscapes, not just, not just working on them. And we want to be able to invite pollinators and natural predators and also butterflies and birds into our landscapes. So we're going to look at four things that you can do, that any of us can do to create a pollinator from the landscape. So the first is employing really good gardening practices. Number two is selecting pollinator friendly plants. So these are plants that provide quality nectar and pollen for bees and other pollinating animals. Creating a pollinator habitat. So that's beyond even the foraging part of it, but also talking about habitat, nesting, etc. And then considering alternatives to lawns and ground covers. So we'll start with good practices. This is something I bet that I spend at least half of my time talking to people about good gardening practices, things that create healthier plants. So we start with good soil health. We need good drainage in our soil so that that water doesn't accumulate, 
so that it drains well, it goes back into our aquifers and it's available to the plants through their root systems. We also want organic matter that helps with good drainage. It also adds some nutrients to uh, the soil that the plants can then take up. It also encourages microorganisms and those microorganisms are very important to a healthy landscape. We want to water the plant zone, the plant root zone. So put that water where the plant roots are. That's what's taking up the water. The leaves do not take up the water, the flowers don't. We want water applied right at the root zone. This also reduces splashing soil, which reduces the potential for diseases that might be in the soil, pathogens, bacteria, fungi, et cetera, from splashing up onto those lower leaves of the plant and then kind of spreading throughout the plants and the plants nearby. We want to space our plants by their mature size, the size that they are going to be on the tag when you read it. So not the size that they come in the one gallon container or the four inch pot, but how big are they going to be when they are full grown? This improves air circulation. That air circulation and more light also to the branches will help to reduce the humidity within the canopy of the plant. This is whether it's an herbaceous, like a flowering plant, or if it's a shrub. And we want to improve that because it reduces the humidity and it also increases the light to the branches. It creates better bloom and it also results in fewer pest issues. Those pests like to be in shady, humid areas. And so the more we open up those canopies and allow that light to get in there, the more airflow we have around it, the better we're going to have from a health standpoint for our plants. And then we want the form to be great. We want it to be the best it can be. So if it's supposed to be a spreading plant, we want to be sure that we plant it far enough away from the other plants so that it can truly spread out and give us its natural form and size. Here's an astilbe. This happens to be called rhythm and blues astilbe. I planted this a, a while ago. Uh, you can see that these three astilbes are spaced apart. So there's plenty of room around them. They're just planted, so they will actually grow and get larger as they, uh, as they uh, develop. In the tag, you can see that we have really good information. And this tag, these tags are written by the growers, by the people most experienced with the plants. So you can see the exposures, part sun. We've got a height of 25 inches. That spread is going to be a range of 16 to 20. That kind of just depends on the quality of the growing conditions. The optimal growing conditions are going to result in the optimal size. Hardiness zones, four to nine, that's really important. I'm sitting in zone four right now. You might be in zone three or zone five. And, the, when, and that means that the plants have been proven in evaluations to be winter hardy to minus 30 degrees. And this plant happens to be great for cutting too. Good gardening practices mean healthier, more stress-free plants. So when plants are under stress, it's just like human beings. When we get overworked and we've got maybe family issues or we've got some problems going on and we get stressed out, we tend to be more susceptible to diseases. And that's the same thing with plants. They can, uh, they, they're not as resistant to diseases. They're not as resistant. They can't like bounce back after damage from animal feeding or insect damage. So we want to choose plants with growing requirements that match the site conditions you have in your yard. So this is the key because those plants will then be growing in their optimal growing conditions. This means that you have to know your site conditions. You have to understand the kind of soil you have, the amount of light that you have, the spacing you have. Uh, you want to buy healthy plants also. I know that sometimes you can walk into a garden center and they've got the 50% off table and you're thinking, geez, I, I can make that plant look great. You know, a little pruning here, putting it in a new pot, but really choose plants that are really healthy plants to start with. Look them over, make sure they haven't uh, brought and they're not bringing in any insects into your garden. Look for resistant cultivars and varieties. These are varieties and cultivars that have been bred to be resistant to diseases. And also, look, they look, they will have fewer pest issues as well. They'll just be healthier plants overall. So one of the things that we do, we talk about IPM. So this is integrated pest management. And there's some considerations to think about as part of that. So identification, is this actually a pest? So if you look in the top corner, you can see the dill flower. And in my hand, I have a little black and orange insect. And uh, I'm not sure if everybody knows this, but this is actually a ladybug larvae. You would never think that if you didn't know it. 
uh, and you might actually think it's detrimental to your plant. So you want to get to know what insects you have. So is it a pest? That's the first question. Same with diseases too. You want to notice, you know, is it really a disease or is it something from say, you know, wind damage or maybe it's uh, storm damage. Maybe it's from too much salt being put on your driveway or sidewalk. Is the damage really injurious or is it really just cosmetic? Most of the problems that I come across with homeowners, it's cosmetic. And, uh, and it's something that isn't going to kill the plant. But somebody wants, you know, humans kind of like perfection. And so we get concerned when we see spots or we see uh, damaged parts of our leaves on our plants. But really, sometimes it's simply cosmetic. So that's important to know too. How important is the plant? Is it an annual plant that you're going to be pulling out in a couple of months? Or is it a virally valuable perennial? Is it a woody plant, a tree or shrub? Those tend to be more expensive, not only up front to buy them, but also in the time that it takes and the commitment that you make to that plant when you plant it. Will treatment actually prevent more damage? Sometimes treatment isn't going to help. We've missed our window of opportunity for treatment. Uh, if it's not treated, will this problem spread more? So those are some basic things to think about. And this is IPM, Integrated Pest Management. Whenever you do have an issue, you want to start with non-chemical management. So most of the time, we can solve our problems without using chemicals. Most of the time. Physical removal, if it's an insect. I have mealy bugs on some of my house plants. I look at those plants, I look them over, I use a Q-tip to pick it off. Uh, so hand removal is important too. Sometimes just spraying a plant with water. If the plant is small enough, you can put it in your kitchen sink and spray it. Uh, if it's bigger, put it in your shower and give it a wash. Uh, create barriers. Outside, you might create, put netting over plants to protect them or fence plants from, uh, say, animal browsing. Put on row covers. Kaolin clay is another type of barrier. It's actually a type of clay that's used in cosmetic products. You can purchase it, mix it up in a sprayer with water, and it will, it will give it a little bit of a dusty look to the leaves, but uh, it will also be distasteful to some insects. And then traps. So I just want to point out that this trap is a beetle trap, Japanese beetle trap. We have Japanese beetles. They're here to stay. But the trap is not the answer. Uh, these are designed for monitoring. So they were, they're designed to find out when the Japanese beetles are appearing. So then you can protect your plants. Uh, for management, uh, things like slugs and apple maggots, those things you can manage by trapping them. So we have also, we have sticky traps for apple maggots and slugs you can put in beer traps. And we have good information about all of these insects and how to manage them on our extension site, yard and garden. Sometimes you have to use a pesticide. So you start with the lowest impact, the least toxic pesticides. Not saying you don't treat them with the utmost respect. You protect yourself. You wear gloves. You wash your hands. Uh, you be careful when you're using them. You follow the instructions on the label. Some of these are things like horticultural oils. They will suffocate soft-bodied insects. Insecticidal soaps. They are thought to disrupt cell membranes in soft-bodied insects. Neem oil, this is a naturally occurring a pesticide that's found in the seeds of the neem tree. It's been used for many, many years. It interrupts insect feeding. It also acts as a repellent and it will interfere with insect hormone systems. So these are low, what are called low impact pesticides. But again, I cannot say it enough to be very respectful of these pesticides. A pesticide is designed to kill. And so we want to be very safe when we use them. Again, read those labels and apply as indicated. Some other low impact pesticides, Bt, Bacillus thuringiensis. This is actually a soil microbe. It's naturally occurring. It's safe for people and birds and mammals. It does not affect them. And there are different strains. There's, I think, up to, say, uh, roughly of 30 different strains of Bt. And each one is effective against a different kind of larvae. So it makes a protein that becomes toxic to the larvae or caterpillar so that when it eats that, it will digest that and it will then kill the larvae. Spinosad is a fermentation of naturally occurring bacteria. It's effective against caterpillars, sawflies, thrips. 
It affects the nervous systems. However, it is highly toxic to bees when wet. So this is why it's important to read the label. You've got to read the label and it will tell you uh, if something is toxic to bees. Follow the instructions. Sometimes you'll see a bee advisory box. Not all the time. This is a fairly new development on some labels, but this will uh, indicate that this is a toxic uh, product for bees. Treat all pesticides as if they're highly toxic. I can't say that enough. And I know this is the third time I've said it in the past five minutes, but follow all those label instructions. It's so important, including PPE. We all kind of know what that is after COVID, uh, but it's important that personal protective equipment be used. That's gloves, masks, long pants, jeans, all whatever, uh, making sure that you are not getting and, and that you're minimizing any secondary exposure. That's the most common way we get pesticides into our system. And if you have a question or concern or want to read more about a pesticide before you use it, take a look at the National Pesticide Information Center. It's a super helpful website. I refer to it all the time, and it's easy to understand. So that's a little about best practices, good gardening practices, and that can be, that can apply even beyond pollinators. But our second thing, let's get a little more specific and talk about selecting plants for pollinators. So we want wide plant diversity. We have over 400 different bees in Minnesota. About 20 of those are bumblebees. So we have bees of all different sizes, shapes, all different attractions to different kinds of plants. Some of them are generalists and feed on a multitude of different plants. Some of them are very specific and they pollinate certain plants and they feed on those plants. We want plants that provide nectar and pollen and habitat resources. We want that continuous bloom, if possible, from April through October as best we can. And we wanna plant in masses of flowers so that there's plenty to forage on for our bees. You wanna avoid what's called a bee sterile landscape. And this is an example of one. Uh, it's primarily evergreens and lots and lots of traditional lawn. There are very few flowers that provide pollen and nectar in this picture. And so this is essentially the barren wasteland for bees. We get a lot of questions about choosing between native and non-native cultivars and species. And, and one of the things that I wanna point out is that most of the plants in your landscape should be native plants. They provide the best food quality, uh, pollen, nectar, they also are the most adaptable to our incredibly variable weather that we have, thanks to climate change. So native plants are terrific. We have native cultivars too of our native plants, and then we have non-native plants. So you can shoot for maybe three quarters of your landscape being native plants and maybe leaving a little bit of room for non-native plants too, because we do have some really great non-native uh, plants, and they do offer quite a bit of diversity. But here's an example. So how do you choose between, let's use echinacea as our example. So here we have echinacea and gustifolia. This is a Minnesota native. You can see the recumbent petals. They kind of flip down and back. Then we have echinacea purpurea, which is native to our eastern North America. So it's not native here in Minnesota, but in gustifolia, that species is. The two look fairly similar. They're not a whole lot different. Uh, and then we get to Echinacea purpurea bright star, which is a cultivar of Echinacea purpurea. So it's a native cultivar. It too looks fairly similar to the first two uh, plants. The center is a little bit smaller, but it still has a nice big open form that makes it really easy for bees to do business with. Then we get to Echinacea rasmataz. This is clearly a hybrid, very difficult for plants to get to those important plant parts that house the pollen and also the nectar. So if you were gonna choose plants, if you got into a lance, into a nursery and you took a look at these four different plants, you could choose any of the first three and use them in masses. You could still use erasmataz, but it's not gonna be a pollinator friendly plant. It's too hard. Those plant parts are so concealed if they're even there at all. And it's just not a good pollinator plant, but you can use cultivars of native plants. So this is kind of a thought process for how to choose plants when you get into that garden center and you're overwhelmed by the beauty in front of you. You can kind of use this as a 
kind of a guideline for choosing plants. If you're replacing plants, you wanna choose pollinator friendly plants, we really ask you to do that. So I gave the example here, we have native blood root, which I have a ton of in my yard. I love this plant, early season, nice wide open flower, easy for the plants, uh, for the bees to get down to those nectaries and then also to the anthers that carry the pollen grains. And it is a tough plant, it's adaptable. Uh, then there's the double petal blood root. This is a cultivar of a native of our native Sanguinaria canadensis called multiplex. Not such a good pollinator plant. You could still put it in your garden, but it's really, we encourage, you know, think more about using those plants that are really pollinator friendly. Sometimes people want to choose plants for specific insects. So the rusty patch bumblebee, which is our state insect and is endangered, uh, they like bee balm, turtle head, blueberries, joe pie weed, iron weed. Those are just a few. They're very much generalist too. So they uh, will feed on lots of different plants. And then there's other rarer specialist bees, and they like things like our native fringe loose strife sunflowers and bellflowers. So you can also research the kind of bees that you want to attract or that you've seen in your landscape and then go ahead and uh, choose plants for those specific bees. A great resource if you are new to pollinator gardens is our Plants for Minnesota Bees. This is at the beelab.umn.edu, another great resource for how you can help bees. I like this list. It's one page and it is ordered in bloom time. So we start with the Catragus cruzgali. This is hawthorn. This is a tree, a blooming tree, and it's early bloom time. Look at that. Then we have geranium maculatum, wild geranium. That's also early. So it works its way down the list by time of bloom. And if you remember, one of the things we want to do is have blooms from April through October. So if possible, and it gets down to those late bloomers like our stiff goldenrod and our calico aster. So this, if you are new to this and you're overwhelmed by all the plant lists that you see, choose this one and start with this one. It's a great, easy place to start. You can always add more plants. We have a web page also on Yard and Garden called U of M Extension Flowers for Pollinators. We have a plant elements of design plant selection database that has a native uh, landscape use as well as uh, for pollinators. We have a native plants web page. We also have trees and shrubs for pollinators. These are all great resources for you. And I encourage you to reach out to the Xerxes Society and download their Great Lakes region plant list. That's our region here from Minnesota. And of course, our DNR has terrific resources as well. There's lots of different resources for pollinator plants. So I thought I would share with you some of my favorite pollinator plants. These are from my yard. This is a picture of my entry garden. We talked about the blood root. This was the first plant, one of the early plants that my mother introduced me to. And she broke the stem and it bleeds kind of an orangish color dye. And in, uh, what she told me then, and, and I, I'd have to verify this, is that uh, indigenous people use that for painting and dyeing things. It's an early food source for early bees. So these are the bees that are emerging from the ground early in the spring before there's a whole lot blooming, except for things like bloodroot. And it's one of our native plants. Crocus vernus, this is our crocus, our bulb that we plant in the fall for spring bloom. This is a great early spring bulb. It's great for the early ground nesting bees. Lanicera cerulea, this is honeyberry. This is actually an edible plant. It has terrific blue fruit that rivals uh, blueberry flavors. There are many different cultivars and they bloom at different times. So you can choose an early blooming honeyberry. You do need two different cultivars that are blooming at the same time so that they will cross pollinate. Uh, I have grown Aurora borealis and tundra in my yard with great success. Uh, and these are terrific for bumblebees. So bumblebees like the flowers on this plant. This is the plant. Uh, you can see the picture in the, uh, the little picture down in the bottom left corner. That is a bumblebee feeding on my tundra honeybee or honeyberry, which is right here in my garden. There are annuals too that are important. So centauria, how many people like bachelor buttons? I think that was also one of my early flowers I learned about when I was a kid. And I really like the true blue bachelor buttons. 
great for all sizes of bees. I've seen bumblebees. I've seen small native bees on there as well. And tithonia. Tithonia is this great big orange plant that's blooming on both sides of the doors. Uh, it's over my head, so it can get very, very large. It's also called Mexican sunflower or torch flower. Uh, really a beautiful continuous bloom all the way up until fall, and the bees are all over it. One of my favorites, Dahlia purpurea. I love the unusual flower shape of this plant and it's fabulous for small bees. It's a native plant. It has high quality nectar and pollen. It blooms in the summer. It will, <clears throat> it will reseed. When you first plant it, you wanna be sure that you fence it from rabbits because they too love it. Asclepias incarnata, this is one of our milkweeds. There are many milkweeds that we can grow here. This is a native uh, plant. It's, a, has, um, it's for beneficial insects of all kinds, from beetles to butterflies to bees. It does have an aphid issue in my yard, and I've heard from a couple other people too. These are oleander aphids, these yellow aphids. Uh, so that is one thing to consider. So you want to encourage the predators of these aphids, like praying mantis and those uh, um, ladybug larvae that I mentioned earlier. And the, But it's a very easy to grow plant and it spreads like milkweeds do by the seeds that come out of the pods. Eutrochia maculatum. This is a cultivar of Joe Pye weed called Gateway. This is in the front of my yard growing in my rain garden. I planted it here on purpose as a living blockade. We have a dead end street that we live on and people back into our driveway to turn around. I wanted to be sure they didn't back into my rain garden. So I put this plant right on the edge as a living barricade. It also provides really interesting winter interest. Not today because we have so much snow, it's buried, but it's a big attractant for bees and wasps. And Rusty Patch Bumblebee. I was so excited when I found the Rusty Patch Bumblebee. I had confirmed that that's what it was. And this was in 2021. So that was really exciting. My favorite herbaceous plant of all time is the uh, Gentiana andrusii. And this is a bumblebee resource and it is a true blue flower. I love true blue flowers and there's not that many around. Uh, and so this is a case where these petals are closed like this and the bee has to be quite strong and quite uh, able to open up those petals. So you can see it's trying to pry open this one. That's not quite ready maybe. Now it's going to crawl into this one and it will completely envelop itself in the flower, collecting the nectar, drinking the nectar, getting the uh, pollen on its body, which it will then put into its pollen uh, uh, on its hips. And uh, it's a pretty cool plant, really beautiful plant. Uh, ironweed, Vernonia fasciculata. Uh, uh, this is a mid to late summer bloom. This will spread very easily. So give it lots of room. It's a very tall plant, big bee magnet. Uh, it has hollow stems also for stem nesting bees. And crocus pulchilus. This is fall blooming crocus. This is a crocus that comes up around Halloween. Uh, the bulbs are planted in the fall and it blooms September through November. So kind of a cool thing to have these little delicate purple flowers blooming amongst all the fallen leaves. And it's also a great late season plant for those bees that are still hanging around. So let's look at creating a pollinator habitat in your yard. I wanna point out in this picture that leaf mulch is being used and this helps to create a habitat for overwintering insects, such as some of our queen bees. So leave the leaves. Less tidy is better for bees. Don't be so tidy. Uh, mulch selectively. If you're gonna use any kind of wood mulch, then use it very selectively. In other words, you might just need it around uh, an area that you walk on. Maybe it's a pathway that you walk through your garden. I have a back door in my garage that leads to my garden space. And, and so down the couple of steps, and then I just have a space that's got some mulch and then it leads into the rest of the garden. So that's really the only place that I put mulch. Uh, you want to leave open soil for ground nesting bees. You can see the circles in these pictures. These are actually ground nesting bee uh, nests. So uh, there's a, it's a single solitary bee. It creates these tunnels underground. It lays little uh, lays about five eggs 
in five tunnels, puts a little food ball next to it, and then takes off. And those uh, insect, those eggs hatch, the larvae eat the, the food, which is essentially pollen, and then they emerge in the next year. So you can see they're right in my hostas. They're in a kind of a bare rough area. And, uh, and that leaf mulch will also create uh, overwintering habitat for bees that stay through the winter, that live through the winter like our queen bees. Uh, creating habitat, uh, bees like to nest in out of the way places. So places that are quite undisturbed. So it might be rock piles. They like to live in the crevices, in grasses, piles of grasses. This uh, bumblebee nest on the right hand side was in a pile of ribbon grass that we were cleaning out and a little bit of barnyard grass and some other reedy stuff. They like to live in dead trees, logs and stick piles too. Leave hollow and pithy stem. So pith is the center of a stem. It's kind of a, I always likened it to kind of like styrofoam, but the bee will kick it out. You can see in this picture, this is a penstemon. This is actually a penstemon cultivar called dark towers. And the bee has tunneled into that and kicked that pith out of that stem. So they are going to be laying eggs in that stem. In the spring, you can cut stems of varying diameters and heights, roughly eight inches to maybe 24 inches can be quite a large range. You can have different heights and you can leave them through the next summer. Uh, take anything that you've cut or any stems that fall and just put them over, tuck them back into your garden, uh, tuck them behind it under a tree, put them in a back area where they can be out of the way so that if there aren't eggs in those stems, they can hatch out and the bees can emerge or that the bees can actually find them and use them for nests too. And of course you wanna avoid using any kind of pesticides or having any kind of pesticide drift on any of these stems. Here's a great picture. There's those uh, Joe pieweed and they're standing in my yard. And this is in the winter. Uh, I've cut them down to about eight inches. And you can see I have a couple varying heights here and I've just left them. And the plant will come up in the spring and completely hide them. You won't see them. And so it's a very uh, short amount of time that you see these stems and you're leaving those open for the bees to nest in. And this is what I do with my sticks. I have a spruce tree off to the side of my yard and I just kind of take those, anything I cut off and I just, or if they fall over, I just move them over to that space or leave them right where they are too sometimes depending on the garden, but I don't destroy them. I don't compost them. I don't burn them. So I just tuck them over there and they just, reside there until they break down naturally. So more about wild bee nests. This is a can be complicated for people. And we have a great handout from the uh, from the bee lab on building wild bee nests and what to do about them. And here is how to create habitat for stem nesting bees. So this explains kind of the timeline. So in the winter, we leave these stems. In the spring, we cut them back. Uh, in the summer, the plants grow up around them. In the winter, in the fall, you just leave them, they fall over. And in the spring, then the bees will emerge. So it's a really easy to follow chart that will help you with determining that. And look at the photo down below. It shows the bees, the eggs that are laid there. And it shows building material, the food that the bee put in there, and also then the stems. So it's really a cool picture. My last point today for you is, is thinking about alternative lawns and then using plants in different ways. So considering alternative lawns, and I know James is going to talk about bee lawns tomorrow, but I think I'll give you kind of a little preview. Um, alternative lawns and plantings that benefit bees can improve your landscape aesthetics. They add color and texture and form. They create pollinator habitat and, and reduce your maintenance. Bee lawns are another option too. And then shrubs and perennial uh, perennials on slopes and hillsides. So bee lawns uh, will grow in sun to part shade. It reduces your mowing and your fertilization and your watering. These plants are very low uh, nutrient requirements. They don't, once they're established, don't require a lot of water. And then they can also be planted near like your vegetable garden or your orchard to encourage pollination. Why would you choose a bee lawn? Well, the flowering plants provide nutrition for bees. They reduce soil compaction too because their roots are big and bulky and they help to break up root, break up the soil compaction, which provides better drainage overall. They're lower maintenance. They require lower inputs. Our Dutch clover, which is one of four flowers in a bee lawn mix, fixes nitrogen. In other words, provides nitrogen to other plants like your grass plants. 
Uh, and also those healthier grass plants will be less of an issue with fertilization requirements. And they're suitable for moderate to light traffic areas as well. An alternative lawn option is a bee lawn. So these are cool season turf grass species, the fine fescues and Kentucky bluegrass. And then they're also a combination of low growing flowers that tolerate mowing. And they also provide this high, fol high foraging. Uh, low maintenance, low input. This is a picture out at the bee center at the Arboretum. You can see lots of Dutch clover. The seed mixes consist of fine fescue, which is a really important uh, tough grass that is low nutrient. It grows in different amounts of light and uh, it's a pretty um, resilient plant, drought tolerant plant. There's also some Kentucky bluegrass, self heal, which is the purple plant in the bottom of the slide. Then uh, we also have white clover and then creeping thyme, which is in the middle here and then also ground plum, which is the larger picture. And these are all important food sources, especially for native bees. The bee lawn mix, you'd think that it's mostly flowers, but it's actually mostly grasses. 80 to 90% uh, of the 90 of the 90% of cool season grasses is fine fescue. And then 10 to 20% of that 90% is Kentucky bluegrass. Really only seven to 10% are perennial flowers, the ground plum, which blooms from April through May. So it's an early season plant and it is particularly attractive to long tongued bees. So these are bees with very long tongues that need to reach deep into the corolla of the flower. Dutch white clover, which blooms pretty much from May through October and that supports 56 varieties of bees. And that's probably a number that continues to rise. Self heal, which blooms from June through August, native bees and then creeping time from July through August. And that is particularly important to short tongue bees. So you can see we have that April through October bloom time, which is what one of our goals for when we plant for bees. A bee lawn's not for everybody yet. <laughs> we hope it becomes something that more people embrace. It is not a no maintenance lawn. There is mowing. Uh, it, is, uh, it, it is sometimes, it is not full of noxious weeds. That's another uh, thing that people think. It is not all broadleaf plants. So as I mentioned earlier, 90% of it is grass plants. Uh, and it is not entirely herbicide free. We want it to be. But sometimes as you're establishing a bee lawn, you may get a thistle growing and then you either can dig it out or you need to treat it and just spot treat it. Just use it very specifically on those plants that you need to get rid of. You can't broadcast it like we do now with weed and feed kind of things because you will kill off all the bee plants, all the flowering plants. So it needs, it's got a little bit more work up front as it gets established. It has a little different look also. Uh, and if you're going to establish it, you may wanna renovate your whole lawn or you might wanna just oversee a healthy lawn. And we have great instructions on how to do that on our website. And I'm sure James will talk about that tomorrow. Uh, that weed management is important during establishment. Sometimes you have to hand weed it. Uh, and then again, as I mentioned, just an occasional spot treatment for those really tough weeds to get rid of them. Pollinator plants on slopes and hillsides is a great opportunity. So rather than try to mow a hillside or grow grass on it, uh, think about removing that and putting trees, shrubs, flowers, grasses for caterpillars for, uh, uh, and then nesting habitat. Also, this eliminates the mowing, which can be really difficult and even dangerous if the slope is, is long and steep. It also reduces erosion and minimizes runoff because all these plants, all those complex root systems are going to be taking up and holding that water and preventing it from running off. This is an example of my neighbor's hillside. Uh, you can see it's very steep. It was covered in things like buckthorn and garlic mustard. There were a few wildflowers and then a lot of volunteer trees and shrubs. And this is it now planted with bee uh, friendly plants. So these are native plants, flowers, grasses. They have some boulders in there for look. Uh, it's really an attractive hillside. So my takeaway messages to you today are to look for and, and recognize, watch for those insect pollinators in your yard, incorporate pollinator friendly plants, think about creating habitat, and think about also if you're replacing plants or shopping for plants this spring, be sure to be looking for those that are pollinator friendly. 
take, you know, print out some of those lists that I mentioned, take them with you. Um, using pesticides, just don't use them or use them very carefully, both for our pollinators, but also for your personal health. Read the labels, uh, apply them as, met, as noted on the label, spread the word about pollinators, talk to your neighbors about it. Uh, the more plantings we have for pollinators, the more space there is for them to feed and forage. And then always choose planting flowers and lawns and trees and shrubs for pollinators. So that is my talk for you today. I hope it's been inspiring uh, on a snowy day like today. I know I enjoy looking at some of those pictures myself. <laughs> Thank you, Julie. Oh, what a great job. You, you did such a great job at presenting and helping us understand how each of us can take practical steps you know, real world application um, towards helping pollinators in our in our own communities. We have a lot of questions on the docket for you. <laughs> it was a great presentation and I think a lot of people can apply it. So I'll jump right into the questions. Uh, the first one, have you seen any differences in pollinator attraction to different hybrids of the same species? Or is the hybrid selection not as important as the species selection? I think this, uh, if you were going to be very specific, I think the species selection is important for choosing native species, uh, but you can also choose the uh, cultivars of native species as well. So either one, you can do a mixture. Again, I, the rule of thumb, and this comes from uh, Alan Brianhagen, who's our director of operations and a, a native plant expert here at the Arboretum. He has said, you know, try to put, try to make your landscape biomass about 75% native plants. So that leaves room for some of the non-natives. Uh, and then you can also look for um, some of the cultivars of our natives as well. Did that answer the question? <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> um, can you talk about the risk of a purchasing from a nursery that is selling a cultivar that is domesticated and traits we are looking for to benefit pollinators that have been bred out. Example, double petals. Sure. So the, the problem with, so let's use the razzmatazz as an example. So, so the petals, uh, the whole shape of the flower, the form is not conducive to a bee actually getting in there and getting the uh, nectar or pollen that that plant may have. In some cases too, uh, and I'm not a plant breeder, but uh, as I understand it, in some cases, the parts of the plant like anthers and, um, and the nectaries are given up in lieu of more floriferous flowers, more petals, uh, bigger flower, um, double petals, triple petals, and, uh, and that can also be detrimental to bees as well. So you want to look at the the shape of the flower. Again, I always like to say it's easy to do business with. The plant, you know, is open. You can see the anthers. Uh, the bee can see them. The bee has a landing place. Uh, in some cases, the bees, the flowers are also um, tubular. And of course, there's many shapes. And some of those have to do with uh, the bee crawls into the flower or the tongue goes into the flower. That also is true of things, uh, some of the birds, like hummingbirds too. Great. If non-native echinacea cross with our native, won't that harm our native in the long run? Well, uh, that I do not think that that actually happens too much. So, um, and that is not something that I, the people that I've talked to um, have not said that that is an issue. Uh, they don't cross like squash cross. Um, Robin, you might be able to weigh in more on that, being a flower grower yourself. Sorry, there I am. I, I have never seen the non-natives. We grow quite a lot of echinacea, and I have never seen the non-natives cross, um, although we do tend to plant the natives. Even the natives near each other don't cross. They stay true to form. So I, I'm not sure that's a worry. And a lot of that non-native or those cultivated echinacea, a lot of the cultivation removes the pollen, removes the stuff that makes a mess. So I don't, I wouldn't worry about the, the, the big thing with echinacea and all of those plants I worry about. And somebody did ask a question about the aster yellows. 
is the aster yellows. Right. Yeah. That's that's spread by that aster leaf hopper. And once that plant gets it, that's the end of that plant. So aster right. yellows does not impact pollinator health except if it prevents the flower from producing pollen. Right. So Julie, we got a lot of questions about um, where to find a lot of these native plants and sure. the best sources. And I know I I kind of like to use the um, Minnesota DNR's kind of list mm -hmm. of, of approved seed dealers. Is there mm -hmm. any others that you would um, recommend? Um, there's certainly Minnesota Grown, which carries more than just uh, flowering plants, but also a lot of vegetable and fruit plants as well. Um, also Minnesota produced, I think it's also got honey and syrup and other things that people produce. So that's another good spot. I always, I always say, talk to your local nurseries, you know, buy as close to home as you can and, uh, and shop and talk to the people who work there and ask them about these plants. Um, if you don't ask them, they're not going to know that there's something that people want. So, um, I think that that's important. You can also start a lot of these plants from seed. So you could purchase seed too. And uh, if you're concerned about whether the plants have been treated with pesticides is again, ask, you know, talk to people. Um, don't just assume one way or another, but uh, I think most people uh, feel like if um, most nurseries are really, really conscientious, uh, at least the people that I've talked to uh, is that they are concerned for pollinators just like we are. And they're not out there trying to just, you know, pretend that this isn't a problem. So talk to talk to your nurseries, shop local, start from seed, collect seed. Uh, I collect the Tithonia seeds every year and start those myself. Um, kind of a fun project, especially in the middle of winter. So, uh, so those are all things that you can do too. Board of Soil and Water Resources has sure. a big guide that lists, um, depending on where you are in Minnesota, it lists places that you can buy the native plants. Right. And then for seed catalogs, um, I look for cat seed catalogs that have prairie or natives or something that gives you an idea that it's natural. Not that all seed catalogs that boast that are, but that's a good place to start. And there are many of them out there where you can, uh, I'm seeing Mother Earth Gardens, things like that. Right. that more wholesome. There are a lot of them. We have a local nursery in Morris that really specializes in natives. That's awesome. So yeah, look local, ask local. Right. That's I just, what I found. Sorry. I was just going to add that um, a lot of soil and water conservation districts, in addition to their tree sale, um, do some kind of pollinator mix or wildlife mix um, so you can buy seedlings there as well. Right. And I'm sure James will talk about uh, bee lawn mixes tomorrow. Yeah, we got a lot of questions about which one of these pollinator and, and a lot of questions about shade. And I don't have a sunny area. Um, I have a shady area. Is, are there any kind of plants that you would recommend for some of these pollinator friendly ones that are in these shady locations? Well, definitely uh, some of our wildflowers, some of our uh, forested wildflowers. Um, there's a lot of spring ephemerals. In other words, really, you know, the early season plants that are um, shade tolerant. Uh, you can also do bulbs. You can do, um, there's a lot of ground covers too, that uh, things like um, sweet woodruff and some other ones that also are, are good for shady areas. Um, it's really, again, looking at the, as you mentioned, the catalogs or talking to your uh, nurseries and saying, I have a shade area. Uh, looking at some of that, the, like the list of Minnesota plants for bees has the sun requirements, full part or uh, shade. So those are other options too. Creeping Charlie, by the way, is not a good bee plant. Um, actually, James, tomorrow, if when you talk to him, he when he was a graduate student, he did a research. Uh, he did some research on the quality of the flowers from Creeping Charlie and found that they lack the rewards, the pollen and the nectar rewards. And the only reason we see those bees all over is they have a behavior called constancy that they will forage. On the same flower until they've kind of exhausted 
that mass and then move on to the next. So we see a lot of them and there's a lot of flowers and they might get a little bit here and there, but um, you might want to ask him about that tomorrow because I'm sure he can give better details than I am. I would just add for shade plants, I um, have a lot of shade in my yard and some specific plants that have done well in shady areas in zone four kind of metro area of Minnesota um, would be Jacob's Ladder right. and Wild Geranium. And um, I do like blood root. I've had mixed success, but for other reasons, probably. And then some of our golden rods, like zigzag, zigzag goldenrod has done well in my yard. Great. Yeah, I forgot about the geranium. Mm -hmm. I have a lot of that. <laughs> Another common question that kind of keeps popping up is erosion control on a slope garden. What ground cover can you put on these steep slopes until those shrubs can take a hold? Ooh, good question. So one of the one of the challenges that we have when we establish a lake, like let's say you're going to do a slope like that and you bought your pots of your shrubs and they're this big, you know, they're little plants. Uh, you can do things like fill in around them. Uh, clearly, if it's a sunny slope, it's going to they're going to be sunny for a while in those spaces. So that space around the new plants, around the new shrubs and trees, you can fill in with annuals, you can fill in with uh, perennials. And then as those plants get bigger, you would use less and less of the herbaceous plants. You can move the perennials away. You can buy or plant fewer of the annuals, too. You can put down mulch to hold in that soil. Uh, you can also rely on living mulch too. So you can put down, um, you can put down leaves. That's fine. You can fill it full of leaves, save your leaves from the fall before and just pile them on there as a mulch. Uh, and then you can also uh, look at things like um, growing sedges or any plants that are ground covers that will fill in quickly into those spaces too. So uh, you can do a good mix and it really adds texture. I mean, from a landscaping, it looks really cool. Um, you have a lot of variety, you have height differences. So it uh, really enhances that slope overall and, and reduces your work as a homeowner as well. That's always helpful. That's always helpful. That's always good. <laughs> Do you have any great resources for like landscape plans that you've looked into? For plans? Yeah. Uh, I, I don't have any landscape plans, but I know there are a lot of resources, probably people on this call who have done landscape plans or have resources that are out there to help people. We have some somewhere in extension, I think in the Master Gardener program, that uh, we developed a number of years ago. They were small, um, but yeah, oh, somebody put, yeah, uh, soil and water conservation. They've um, they've got some plans and there's wild ones. They have some plants. I knew that would happen. So, so yeah, take a look around. Uh, you can uh, look at some of the local uh, entities and organizations. And I'm sure that this looks, looks to me like there's plenty of opportunities for looking for plans. Oh, you're muted there, Tara. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it looks like we have time for about one more question. Uh, before I ask this question, I do want to launch Julie's after presentation poll. She had a few questions for everyone to answer. We still have 600 people on with us live. Uh, so if everyone can just answer those questions before they jump off the Zoom and while we let Julie answer this one last question, um, we'd be really appreciative of the feedback. So the last question I wanted to get to, um, someone will be starting a pollinator garden this year. Is it less effective if the first year that they start the plants from seed versus purchasing the plants at a nursery? What is your opinion? I think I would do a combination. Uh, I would I would decide which are going to be the major plants in your pollinator garden. And then I would purchase those as transplants from a native plant nursery, for example, or from your local nursery. Then I would fill in with, uh, I would start some annuals maybe like uh, like the Tithonia or some of the other plants like that. And you could also, you could put those down as seed too. So I would do a combination, kind of depends on your budget, it depends on how in a, much in a hurry you are to establish that, uh, that space. And remember, you can always add more plants 
uh, in the future. So you don't have to do everything all at once. But if you're going to be putting in shrubs and trees, for example, into a part of your landscape, do those first and get those in right away and make sure that you space them appropriately. Remember what I said about spacing and then go ahead and start filling in with other plants, too. Awesome. Thank you so much for all those questions. It was kind of rapid fire. And we have a lot of questions that we were unable to answer. But if we didn't answer your question on Friday, I will be sending out that resource email um, where I'll provide resources for you to contact your local extension educator to answer the questions we weren't able to today. So thank you all to all the audience members for your great questions. Please come back tomorrow and Thursday as we'll be having a lot more um, time for Q&A. And that wraps up our first session of the Pollinator Habitat webinar series. Thank you for participating with us today. Uh, like Julie said, tomorrow's presentation will cover the topic of bee lawns. And have a great afternoon. Enjoy the Thanks. nice sun, study. Thanks everybody for uh, having me. Appreciate that. It's great working with you all. You're the best. Thanks for being here, Jules. I'm still getting a few people answering the poll question.